The new queer cinema is a film movement describing queer independent films mainly in the 90s. This movement got its name from the then new term queer, which was beginning to pop up in academic writing starting in the 80s. Queer means gay, lesbian, and transgendered identities and their experiences. It also defines this form of sexuality that is fluid, challenging the traditional understanding of sexuality. It shares a common objective as the popular film genre, film noir, which is to convey inner conflicting and disruptive experiences as a revolt against the conformities of the mainstream. Queer cinema makers have called for a multiplicity of voices and sexualities, and rather than having one unifying aesthetic, they like to have a collection of different aesthetics. One of the important figures in this movement is Greg Araki, a Japanese queer independent filmmaker born in L.A. on December 17, 1959. Originally a music critic for the L.A. Weekly, the influence of the shoegazing, raw genre can be heard through all his films. Araki's work is distinguished by a brash camera style, outspokenness of his characters, and guerrilla style, meaning low-budget, skeleton crew, simple props, using whatever is available, often shot on real location, most of the time without a permit. Araki often works to fight against conventions and practices of the mainstream industry, remaining independent. Araki has spoken about his influences, one of them being Jean-Luc Godard, and his early works in films like Breathless and Weekend. Like Godard, Araki has been known to control every aspect of the craft, including writing, casting, directing, photographing, and editing. Godard and Araki are also very interested in the stories of outsiders and using the motif of the journey, like in his film The Living End versus Godard's Weekend. Araki regularly incorporates the disjointed narrative techniques that Godard also uses, such as jump cuts, handheld cameras, nonlinearity. And he agrees with Godard that outsiders can indeed reject traditional conceptions of film, yet still work within the cinema industry in order to change it. His defining themes reflect the time period that he was living in, of being a queer youth in the 90s, such as living as an outsider escaping from rules, embracing radical and unconventional gender roles and way of life. He features outlaws and fugitives often driven by personal identity conflict and self-disclosure. He often features the motif of the isolated, suffering young man. His films are quite dark and pessimistic at times and hit topics such as being a queer individual in the AIDS generation and the whole invisibility of this topic in the mainstream Hollywood. His films are supposed to be a backlash to the history of under and misrepresentation along with stereotypes of queer people. He shows sexuality to be this social construct and sexuality to be fluid and interchangeable. He aims to control the causes of institutionalized homophobia by hyper-dramatizing its effects and an over-the-top display of queerness. He makes sure that queers are legitimate subjects recognizing all stereotypes aiming for queer youth to exploit their own sense of identity. He finds filmmaking an opportunity for him, a gay man, to represent himself in films in the way that mainstream media would not in his early career. He began his career with two $5,000 films with no permits called The Bewildered People of the Night in 1987, which shows Three people through a breakup of a heterosexual relationship exploring the possibility of a homosexual one. And then the second one, Long Weekend of Despair in 1989, in which a gay youth, typically haunted by a nostalgic longing for his past, falls over the course of a disappointing weekend with old college friends to recapture what they used to have. His first debut, The Living End, is about two gay men, John, a shy film critic, and Luke, a reckless drifter, both of whom are unfortunately HIV positive. But they decide to say fuck everything and they go on a road trip and they are explicit and unapologetic and this film displays gay sex and antagonizes heterosexuality as a backlash to the culture around. Most noted in the queer cinema movement is the teen apocalypse trilogy by Greg Araki. He features a lot of James Duvall and Rose McGowan. The first of these films is called Totally Fucked Up, which is a film about six dysfunctional teens, four gay men and a lesbian couple who have formed sort of a family unit and struggle to get along with each other 
while facing all this drama of being a teenager and other major obstacles. Lots of angst. Araki described it as a, quote, kind of cross between an avant-garde experimental cinema and a queer John Hughes film. So this film is constructed in 15 parts. They're diary-like videos of everyday hopes and frustrations of these gay teens. It's made in celluloid fragments with intercuts of video essays in first person where the character actually talks to the camera. It's a little bit ridiculous, hits a lot of ridiculous points, but also manages to sneak in topics of AIDS and, of course, sexuality. It is actually a film that features a 15-person cast of all gay teens, which was very rare in the 90s. The second film is The Doom Generation, which was made in 1995. It captures this raw, aggressive, nihilistic energy as well as this theme of randomness in postmodern life and the progress that remains to be made toward acceptance of non-heterosexual identities. He actually names it a heterosexual movie by Greg Araki in the opening sequence. The first film of his in which he hired a professional crew due to a healthier budget of $800,000. This follows a couple, Amy Blue and Jordan White, heterosexual, who pick up a drifter named Xavier Red. They embark on this ambiguous journey full of sex, violence, and people from Amy's past. Pretty much everyone is trying to kill them. It is heavy with political commentary as neo-Nazis sexually assault Amy and castrate Jordan for being gay on top of an American flag. Jordan and Amy and Xavier, they all sexually experiment with each other. It is, it is an interesting situation. <laughs> It did not reach financial success, although McGowan was nominated for Best Debut Performance at the 11th Independent Spirit Awards. Nowhere is the last of this trilogy being the most sexual and the most graphic out of all of them. Perhaps also the strangest. Described as Iraqi as a Beverly Hills 90210 on acid. It features many pre-fame actors such as Denise Richard and Christina Applegate. It's about teenagers trying to throw this wild party but before that, they have to survive these drug trips, suicides, assault, and aliens. It follows James Duval with his bisexual polyamorous girlfriend, Mel, and her sort of love interest, Montgomery, and Dingbat, who is her girlfriend. It features a lot of sexual tension. <laughs> And once again, open relationships, dramatize fears and anxiety, such as your parents actually speaking a different language. He also directed something a little bit different called Mysterious Skin in 2004, uh, which is based off a 1995 book by the same title by Scott Heim. It premiered at the 61st Venice International Film Festival. It tells the story of two preteen boys who experience sexual assault and how it affects their lives in young adulthood. One boy becomes reckless, sexually adventurous, and he is a sex worker. He is also gay. And the other is more of a nerdy type of character. He retreats to aliens and abductions. Araki said, quote, I read the book back in 1995, and it really had a huge impact on me. It was very beautifully written story, very dark and disturbing. It had a devastating impact on me. I never encountered a story like it before. I knew that if I was going to adapt a book one day, it would be Mysterious Skin. End of quote. In his last film, Kaboom, released in 2014, he gets back to his roots of gay sexual drama and fluid sexuality, violence, and 90s nostalgia. It is a science fiction, mystery, fantasy, comedy film. Yep, all the genres. <laughs> This is about college students investigating a cult while also being involved in, you know, open relationships, sex, all that. It was awarded the first ever Queer Palm Award at the 2010 Cannes Film Festival for its contribution to the LGBT community. Greg Araki's thematic motifs are rootless teens with perhaps absent and abusive parents desperate to connect with one another who attempt to come to terms with their angst and their sexuality in a culture that emphasizes sex and drugs and hard rock and roll. He is clearly very inspired by Jean-Luc Godard of the French New Wave. Like punk music, Araki's film feature a bleak, disconnecting tone that in the end 
ultimately refuses to take either itself or the film's themes too seriously. As a result, like the music videos that have also influenced Araki's editing and storytelling style, narratives that initially appear to be traveling down a linear path end up feeling insufficiently resolved, even somewhat incoherent. Beauty really does lie in the eye of the beholder when it comes to Araki's films. They can be described as extremely angsty, queer, strange, and violent. Most definitely violent. <laughs> he has an ear for music as he loves the shoegazing post-punk genre featuring artists like Nine Inch Nails and My Bloody Valentine and definitely has an eye for cinematography with vivid colors and abstract set design. He definitely has some snippy, witty dialogue with difficult-to-describe plots featuring mostly teens who go around and just live their good old queer lives, doing a lot of things and a lot of nothing at the same time. Things like have a lot of sex, spark taking drugs, drinking, risk and there's definitely a lot of deaths. Either you hate him or you love him. Either way, he is a pioneer in this important movement for those who identify on the spectrum of sexuality.